Why is this game so hot? Celeste, Celeste, whatever you want to call it, is an indie 2D platformer developed and published by Matt Makes Games. They should really change their website's URL. This game started development all the way back in August 2015. Celeste's gameplay was designed to be minimal and accessible, featuring game mechanics to make the game more complex, while at the same time also adding in stuff like an assist mode to make the game a bit less challenging. The game was initially developed for the Pico 8, a virtual machine and game engine, and it was later known as Celeste Classic and appeared in the final product as a hidden minigame. Celeste was released on January 25th, 2018 for the Nintendo Switch, PlayStation 4, Windows, Mac, and Linux, before being released on Xbox One the next day and on Google Stadia in July 2020. Alright, let's try this game out. This game looks charming enough, so it can't be that difficult, can it? Can it? Alright, here we are, so we can jump, climb walls, and dash. This game has 8 chapters divided into many single screen challenges with checkpoints in case, you know. Some of these levels contain paths leading to optional challenges and hidden collectibles, with the main collectible being the strawberries. These strawberries don't serve any purpose besides being fun little collectibles, but you can get an achievement if you collect all of them. Of course, since this game is made to be challenging, there is a death counter for each level. So our goal is to reach the summit of Celeste Mountain, which is actually a real-life location, though in this game it is a more fictionalized version to fit with the theme and setting of the game. And along the way, we encounter a bunch of characters who help us reach our goal, while others try to kill us. I think. So this is the first chapter of the game. This chapter introduces many of the main game mechanics. Every chapter in this game takes around 20 to 30 minutes to finish, with some of the chapters being slightly longer. This first level is a great introduction to the game. It somehow manages to be challenging, but not too difficult at the same time. Of course, since this game is challenging, you're going to die a lot, but it doesn't make you rage a ton, well, at least for me. As the name of the chapter implies, we are in an abandoned city, with the whole place snowing and mechanical structures broken or destroyed. This first chapter is great, but it can be a bit challenging. Now moving to the plot, we are introduced to a hiker named Theo. Theo explains that he came to visit the mountain to explore and take pictures. So we return to climbing the mountain where, at the end of the level, we encountered a memorial and decide to make camp there for the night. So we wake up and enter an abandoned site with space-like blocks scattered around the place. We encounter a mirror and our reflection appears to be a darker version of our character. That darker version of us escaped through the mirror and the space blocks can now be interacted with. By dashing into these blocks, the blocks transport us from one side to another. However, you'll die when you dash into a space block and it transports you straight to a wall. So we find our reflection sitting by a dead campfire. The reflection reveals to be a part of us. You're welcome. Our reflection tries to convince us to stop climbing the mountain. Of course, we refuse and now we have a chase sequence. And this is where everything gets more intense. And by that, I mean the part where you're going to die a lot. I don't hate this part of the level, in fact I think this part is pretty good in terms of gameplay and narrative. It's such an adrenaline rush and it's really exciting, but maybe for some people this part might be a bit longer than it needs to be, but I don't really have complaints about this part of the level, it's just great. So our reflection stops chasing us and disappears. We pick up a payphone and we are answered by a guy who we have a confusing conversation with. Our reflection appears in front of us, transforms the payphone into a monster, and eats us. And would you look at that, it was all a dream. Do I have to say it twice? So we come across this bridge with this dark goo that can kill us and we make our way to a hotel slash resort. The hotel owner, Oshiro, appears in front of us and convinces us to stay here, though we really have to get going. 
Oshiro insisted on taking us to our room, so we followed him. On the way, we encounter a bunch of obstacles with the dark blue again. There are also these gates that can only be opened by activating these orbs. They can be pretty tricky to get to, so keep that in mind. Then we enter a room with a bunch of stuff scattered around. Oshiro says that it is hopeless to clean this place up while being overdramatic. So we decided to clean up the place and Oshiro is very thankful for that. He wants to kill us! We have to dash mash the jello so that everything gets cleaned up and we have to do this 3 times. After smashing a jello, you have to find and talk to Oshiro so that he can open the other two paths to each one of the jello. I don't see why we need to talk to him to open up these paths. He could have just let them open for us after we found him in this room in the first place. And while heading to one of the jello, we encountered Dio trying to get out of this place. And I'm honestly curious as to why he's here and what he's doing here. I know both of us are trying to climb the mountain, but why would he feel the need to enter this place besides, you know, shelter? And even then, how the hell did he get here before me? So Theo escapes through the vents and waits for us outside while we try to help Oshiro and his hotel. Our reflection showed up and said some hurtful things to Oshiro. He gets mad, starts chasing us, and we run for our lives. Here we have another chase sequence and honestly, I think this one's a bit easier than the last one. Oshiro turns to normal and he asks us to leave. Good luck with the repairs, I guess. This chapter is the worst by far. It features wind mechanics and other new objects such as the clouds, green bubbles, and moving platforms that can be triggered by the player's interaction. The clouds give you a little jump boost when timed correctly, while other clouds disappear the moment you jumped on them. The timing can get a while to get used to in order to get the jump boost. Once you jump or dash into a green bubble, it will make you dash into whichever direction you're facing. But it will make you dash almost instantly, so you better react quickly. Do note that the green bubbles reset your dash, allowing you to reach a further distance. And then we have these moving platforms. To get these platforms moving, you can either jump on them or cling to their sides. If they touch a wall, it'll take them a second or two to vanish and then reset to the place they once were. Some of the moving platforms allow you to change their direction manually by simply moving the left thumbstick to the spot where you want to go. And now we have this. Remember in Ninja Gaiden 2, about the second level with the wind mechanic? This one might be worse. Since this game consists of tricky platforms which require you to time your jumps consistently, the wind makes everything way harder. Near the end of the level, I keep failing over and over because of the timing, the platforms, and the wind, obviously. I guess this is karma for not having any lungs. Now back to the story, we meet the old woman who we met earlier in the first level. She tells us that we should give up considering the dangers that lie ahead, but we continue regardless. At the end of the level, we arrive at an old looking gondola. Theo arrives and we both use the gondola to go up. Theo takes another selfie with us as our reflection appears on top of the gondola, causing it to stop and thus we have a panic attack. Theo tries to calm us down by teaching us a coping mechanism he once learned. We calm down and the gondola starts working again and we arrive at the top of the ravine. This chapter takes place in an ancient temple. The entire area is pretty dark so you might need to light the torches scattered around the place by going near them. It's easy to get lost in this place and it might take a while to figure out how to progress and move on to the next area. This chapter introduces tons of new stuff. First up are these red bubbles. They're like the same bubbles from the last chapter but now they act more like the space blocks from the second chapter and you can cancel the dash manually by dashing yourself. We have these blocks that move whenever you dash. These things react fast so you gotta time your jumps properly. There are also these huge buttons that open gates whenever you dash into them. Back into the story. Theo enters the temple before us and now we gotta find him. We encounter him inside the mirror so we have to find a way to get him out. On the way to find Theo, we find a giant mirror that sucks us into a portal and into someplace else. Then we take control of this squid-like monster. We find ourselves and kill ourselves. Feel free to use that quote. We escape that place and the whole temple seems to be freaking out. 
Our reflection appears and she tells us that this whole thing is caused by us. We make our way through and this is where the annoying part of the level comes in. Do you remember the squid-like monster we controlled earlier? Yeah, now there are tons of them and they are trying to kill us. Just like us, they have the ability to dash. They can destroy these orange blocks if they dash into them. We also have these barriers that prevent these monsters from getting into us, but man they're brutal. They follow you everywhere and they act like homing missiles and sometimes they can be pretty difficult to dodge. So we make our way through and enter another huge area with multiple pathways leading to smaller areas. Just like earlier, it's really easy to get lost in this area without the torches lit and it gets more irritating with the fact that there is one of the monsters in there. So just try to stay away from that thing so that it can't chase you everywhere. In this area, there are two gates that you need to open to enter the next area. And since there are two gates, you need to find two keys that can be found in one of the sub areas. So we find Theo who is trapped inside a crystal, which means we have to carry him throughout the end of the level. While carrying Theo, you can't dash but you can still jump, but my goodness this part is annoying. While trying to get out of here with Theo, you gotta complete some chores first. Whether be it activating shields or opening gates, it's annoying. And when you're near a gate that takes you to the next area, there's little to no movement for you to jump when the monster is trying to dash at you. And don't get me started in this part. Two of them? So we reach the end where a giant eyeball is blocking the way, we throw Dio at it, it dies, and we escape. This chapter may be my favorite of the entire game. It's one of the most important chapters story-wise, and the chapter's atmosphere and level design are so lively and colorful. But then again, it still has the difficult platforming. This chapter introduces the feather, which allows us to fly in any direction for a short period of time. We also have these brown platforms where if you dash against one of their sides, the platform will charge in the direction of the side that you dashed against. The platform will continue to charge until it collides with a wall, which will move the platform back to its initial position. Before we proceed with the level, we and Theo started a little conversation detailing what happened in the previous chapter and why both of us are climbing the mountain. Then we get to a short dream section where we are introduced to the feathers. We confronted our reflection, try to come to terms with them, of course the reflection denies, we wake up, and we fall all the way down. We encounter the old lady once again and she gives us some words of wisdom. She also tells us that the reflection is scared and we should confront her once more. We find and try to help her, she denies, again, and we get another sort of chase sequence, except this time we chase her now. All we gotta do is to get close to her and she'll move to another position. Whenever you do this, she'll bounce off and blocks will either fall from above or move in certain directions. In every phase, she gains new attacks like throwing orbs, targeting lasers, and shooting more orbs. I really like this sequence. Not only is it fun and engaging gameplay-wise, but also adds to the narrative of this chapter and the entire story. But like previous chase sequences, you're gonna die here a lot. The reflection finally gave up and now we decide to work together by giving a power up. Now we can dash twice in a row. The whole gang arrives, another conversation, and the chapter ends. So now we have reached the final chapter of the game as we climb from here all the way to the summit. This chapter contains all of the elements and mechanics from the previous chapters, including this, this, these, this, and this. No! This, 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 and this. Not only those, but they also included the settings and designs of the previous chapters. It's really cool to see all the previous chapters crammed into one big finale. Now, of course, since this chapter contains everything from the beginning, this chapter retains the difficulty of the mechanics of the previous levels. Now you might think that this chapter just inserts a previous section of a certain chapter and calls it quits. Well, no. Since we got Mario Kart Double Dash from the last chapter, they designed the levels to challenge this new gimmick we got while also trying to stay true to the level design and mechanics of the certain chapters. 
At the end of each level, our reflection shows up as a purple orb. Once we get close to it, we are lifted upwards and we are taken to the next level. But what does this chapter call for its own besides including previous levels? Well, this chapter has its own level where we are nearing our goal to reach the summit. This entire level doesn't contain a ton of gimmicks from the previous chapters, except the feather from the previous chapter. It mostly involves tricky platforming, tight jumps and dashes, and precise timing. You're gonna die a lot here, which is why there are tons of checkpoints scattered around the place. There are 28 checkpoints here, so you know that this level will take a lot of time and attempts to beat. This felt like the final challenge of the game, except that it isn't. Either way, this entire level is challenging, and I mean it. It is challenging even without all the gimmicks from the previous chapters. This felt like THE challenge because the entire progression in this level depends on you, your timing, and your skills. There are a lot of areas that require said things, and most of them require you to be quick on your feet, meaning you need to react as fast as possible. Moving back to the story, before transitioning to the next level each time, we get a little conversation with our reflection, recalling the events that happened in the previous chapters. These, these conversations didn't feel useless as the whole point in climbing this mountain is to confront our inner conflicts, which is what we did in the last chapter and what we're doing right now in this chapter. Nevertheless, we have finally reached the summit. We have a little heart-to-heart -heart conversation with ourselves, deciding about what we should do next or to return home. We insisted on taking a few more moments admiring the view, and then the chapter ends. But is it really over? No. We return to the old lady's cabin where we'll be celebrating. The whole gang arrives and we'll be baking a strawberry pie for everybody. Now if you collect all of the strawberries before completing chapter 7, you get a different ending depending on how many strawberries you collected. And so far, in my first playthrough, I got this many. Not my best, but at least I got more than 25. Chapter 8 introduces a ton of new features. Most notably, the inability to recharge dashes. Now, on the outside, that doesn't sound too much of a problem, but the levels here are insane. Without having to recharge dashes, you really need to work on your timing in each area. Now, before progressing the entire chapter, there is this gate that blocks you from going any further. In order to get through the gate, you need to backtrack to the previous chapters and collect a total of 4 crystal hearts. Once you collect enough hearts and pass through the gate, you are now in hell. There are fireballs scattered around the place and when the place turns cold, they turn into ice balls that have spikes on the bottom and can be jumped on the top. We have these blocks which will launch a player in the direction that they were touching it from upon being grabbed or landed on. When the environment is cold, these blocks change and they turn into a different kind of block that slowly sink when grabbed or landed on and shatter afterwards. We also have these hot bumpers that can kill you upon contact and when it is cold, these things turn into those bumpers that are found in chapter 6. There are also conveyor walls that launch you upwards when you grab into them, and when it is cold, these turn into ice balls that you cannot grab onto. There are these barriers which are either ice or lava that can kill you if you get close to them. They'll appear or disappear depending on whether the switches are toggled to hot or cold. Now speaking of switches, these things toggle everything between hot and cold. When flipped to hot, the bumpers turn into hot bumpers, shattering blocks into launching blocks, ice walls into conveyor walls, ice balls into fireballs, and the lava gates disappear. When flipped to cold, it does the same thing in reverse. Now that's a lot of gimmicks to take note of. But surely it can't be that difficult, after all this isn't the final chapter of the game, so they might be saving the difficulty from the final chapter. Right? I cannot stress how much time I spent trying to get past this section. It took me so long, but I still got it. I won, but at what cost? And the latter half of the chapter, really challenging. It took so many attempts, but I managed to beat it. 
Oh, I almost forgot the story. Sorry. So we return to the mountain about a year later to explore the mountain's secrets. We are told that the core of the mountain has extreme power and will affect our abilities. After roughly 844 deaths, we enter a dark room. The room is empty, yet it feels nostalgic somehow. This is the final chapter of the game and was introduced as a free update to the game. This chapter is by far the longest and most challenging chapter of the entire game as it introduces tons of new objects and mechanics. The first one is Double Diamonds. In the second subchapter, we lose the ability to dash twice. These double diamonds act like the green gems from all the previous chapters which reset your dashes. But this time, these double diamonds do the same thing but grant us the ability to dash twice. Next we have these exploding fishes. We can bounce on top of them but these guys explode which pushes us in a certain direction when we're right in front, behind, or below them. There are these large jellyfish that can be grabbed to increase hang time. While holding, you can change the speed to fall more slowly or quickly. Normal movement, jumping, or wall jumping are all possible while holding a jellyfish while they must be released in order to dash. Holding onto the jellyfish does not consume stamina and they do not replenish our dashes. These jellyfish are not affected by most surfaces except for these barriers which instantly destroy the jellyfish upon contact. Next we have these futuristic looking platforms that function very similarly to the conveyor belt platforms from the previous chapters. Then we have these generators. When dashed twice, they will remove all electric obstacles from the screen for further progression. Lastly, we have the bird. It launches the player to the right similarly to the purple orbs from the previous chapters. Now that we have all of those out of the way, let's talk about how hard this chapter is. They weren't kidding. This is just the first part of the chapter, and I've died a hundred times. I've spent nearly a total of 2 hours getting past the first 4 sub-chapters, and then there's this. Remember the blue gate from chapter 8? Yeah, well it's back now and you have to collect 15 hearts to progress. This means you have to collect all the crystal hearts from every previous chapter in addition to the hearts of the b-sides. Now, what are the b-sides? They are shorter but more challenging versions of a specific chapter. And don't even get me started with the b-side of chapter 2. I've spent so much time trying to get to this heart. I could have spent all that time trying to get alive, but no. I have to fully beat this game for the sake of existence. This is my curse. I have to beat this game. Even if only a few people watch me do it. Nothing. It's impossible, and I can beat this game. I got all the hearts I needed. Now for the final challenge.
Yes! There's a cutscene? So we're somewhere in the future and we visit the gravestone of the old woman whom we had developed a strong relationship with. We see the bird as a part of the old woman and set off to space. We attempt to catch the bird multiple times. In the process, we begin to accept that Granny will be truly gone forever. Together, we decide to help free the bird that we had cornered, sort of a tribute to Granny. Afterwards, we meet Granny for the last time. We apologize to her for not attending her funeral and thank her for helping us on our journey up the mountain. Granny slowly disintegrates and shortly after, we wake up. We start chatting with Theo who had tried contacting us for a long time. Theo then shows an old photograph of Granny and Theo's grandpa. Finally, we are happy that our experience climbing the mountain with Theo was just like that of Theo's grandpa and grandpa. So we have finally finished the main story of Celeste. What are my thoughts? It was a roller coaster of emotions, I can tell you that. The story tackles depression and anxiety, and what I think the game is telling us is that you have to embrace or work alongside the things that bring you down so that you can reach your full potential. Celeste is full of emotions that we all feel, and some are completely dominated by. Our main objective was to climb the mountain. But as we dive deeper, progress more, it wasn't only the mountain that we have to overcome, but ourselves. And that right there really grabs my attention in this whole story. It's ironic that a game about dealing with stress gave me stress. This game is ruthless to an extent, but it mostly doesn't feel unfair at times. The gameplay is simple and easy to learn at the get-go, but as we progress to each chapter, it gets more and more difficult to adapt these gameplay mechanics because of the added gimmicks in each chapter, right? Each chapter introduces something new that you have to learn, but not in a way that you have to totally master it, if you know what I'm saying. And one thing I thought I liked is that whenever you fail, you pick up where you left off immediately. And it's not like in Cuphead where they show your progress through a level and the enemies mock you to piss you off. Celeste doesn't have any of that and I think that's good because in a way, it somehow correlates with the main theme and message of the story. Despite being the hardest game I've ever beaten yet, this game is a masterpiece. There's a lot to love about Celeste. The story, the smart mechanics of the game, the beautiful soundtrack, the challenging but fair gameplay and level design. They've put a lot of thought and care into this small yet expansive package. And I can't believe I spent 18 hours just trying to beat this game. I should probably go to sleep now.